Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today I would like to talk about a new concept um, in magnetism. It's called magnetic field flux. Well, let me start from very, very simple um, well, analogy. Um, we all know that the sun sends certain amount of energy. And if you would like to know how much energy is falling on a specific um, I don't know, area, you just have to think about the uh, amount of area in, let's say, square meters. You have to know about intensity of the sun rays and basically the angle at which it, it, it falls on this particular area, right? So that's what basically the magnetic field flux is about, right? So um, this analogy is a very simple one and I'll probably have some others. And in the notes for this lecture, uh, I also have some other analogies. Now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on Unizor.com. I suggest you to watch this lecture from the website, rather than, let's say, from YouTube, where you might have found it. Um, because the website, besides being free, um, it also has, for every lecture, it has very detailed notes. And also, all lectures are presented as a course, which means there is certain sequence, there is an order, there is an interrelationship between different lectures. So, obviously, I'll, I'm using certain concepts which I introduced in the previous lectures, etc. So, udesor.com is the way to go. You have to choose the course, Physics for Teens, and there is also another course, Math for Teens, which I consider to be a prerequisite for physics because physics uses mass all over the places. Like today, for instance, we will use integrals. Okay, so let's go back to our magnetic field flux. So first of all, um, we have covered what is magnetic field intensity. Usually uh, use the letter B, that's the vector. Well, it's like the force basically in the field in some way or another. It signifies the strength of the magnetic field at any point in space where this magnetic field exists. So, that's kind of known, it's covered in the previous lectures, so I consider it to be familiar with you. Now, we also know that if you have a direct current in some kind of a uh, wire, let's say, then there is a magnetic field around this particular wire. Now, um, each little piece of this wire creates certain magnetic field around it. And next one is also, and next one is also. Now, um, there was a formula for strength of the magnetic, intensity of the magnetic field, if you have an uh, infinitely long wire. There is another formula, and we did cover this material before, and there is another formula, um, which was, I think it was just the previous lecture, about current um, in a loop, and what kind of a magnetic field it creates, where I did specify, um, if you have an infinitesimally small piece of uh, wire, then it creates magnetic field around it, obviously around on the same level here, but also here and here and here and here. So what is the magnetic field intensity created by this particular infinitesimal piece of wire at some point, let's say here? Well, I'll use the differential because it's infinitesimal. So every piece, infinitesimal piece of the wire, it creates um, the um, magnetic field at intensity mu zero times i. So mu zero is um, permeability of the space because it depends on magnetic properties of the space. Like vacuum is has one permeability, and uh, let's say glass has another. Um, I is obviously the current which is running here. 
also obviously the longer this little piece is the greater magnetic field it creates around it so we have to multiply it by ts now this important distance obviously the further we are the smaller the magnetic field intensity should be so we have to divide it by 4 pi r square if you remember 4 pi r square it's the area of a sphere around this particular piece so the energy which is distributed is distributed onto the whole surface of the sphere and that's why you have this in the denominator now also what's important is this angle let's call it alpha and we have to multiply by sine of alpha now why is that because if alpha is equal to 90 degree which means it's it's here the point is here relative perpendicular to the wire it's stronger than on the same distance here because we see wire at the angle it's actually this part which is perpendicular and that actually is smaller so you have a small triangle here so instead of hypotenuse we see the catetus and that's actually where we are multiplying by sine of a obvious sm uh, sm uh, simple geometry here so this is a general formula <coughs> which we have introduced in the previous lecture now the next step is the current in a loop okay so let's say we have a loop again every little piece of this wire every little piece is the source of magnetic field all right so if you would take this piece or another piece it's the source of magnetic field so if you have a current here then each piece creates certain magnetic field around it now in the previous lecture we have calculated the magnitude and in the center of a ideal circle now if it's not ideal circle well and if it's not a center even for a circle it's much more complex and we didn't really go through calculations it's just you know tedious and lengthy uh, technical calculations which don't really bring much knowledge to you what is important is however that at any point the magnetic field which is created inside this particular loop inside i mean the loop consider the loop is flat this is x y um, plane in the system of coordinates so it's in in the plane this is the plane of the, this board is the x y plane now z goes uh, perpendicularly so at any point since my um, magnetic field lines are around this wire so in this plane all the magnetic field lines will be perpendicular to the plane inside this thing so within the plane all magnetic lines are perpendicular now if you go into space let's say here then obviously the magnetic field lines will be you know somehow directed at some angle or whatever but here magnetic field lines are exactly perpendicular why well very simple magnetic field lines at any point within this are perpendicular to both the direction of the current which is tangential to this loop which means it's lying inside this plane and the radius vector to this point which is also lying in the plane because we are only considering the point inside this loop so the perpendicular to both of them and both of them belong to the plane x y obviously is perpendicular to the entire plane and the only thing which is perpendicular to x y plane is the direction of the z uh, axis so that's why at this particular point the direction will always be perpendicular to this plane so all the different b's here 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 they are all directed into um uh, parallel to the z plane okay that's good because you know if we have they're not 
they might not be equal in magnitude at different points, but they are the same, they have the same direction. That's what's important, which makes our life easier, obviously. Okay. Now, in, in, in a similarity to this concept which I started with, like how much sun energy falls in a specific area, I would like to know how much energy is flowing, magnetic energy, magnetic field energy, if you wish, if you wish uh, is flowing through this particular area. Now, it is important for certain practical um, uh, problems which we will be actually discussing, like self-induction, for instance, etc. Um, so, it's a new concept and it's called magnetic field flux. So, I would like to know, I'm using the word energy loosely, it's not really like energy, because we're talking about intensity of the magnetic field and area through which all these vectors of magnetic uh, field intensity are going through. Basically, I would like to multiply. I mean, if my field has exactly the same value in magnitude uh, at every point inside this loop, I would just multiply my intensity B by the area of the loop. Now, again, same thing. If sun has all the rays uh, falling on certain flat surface on the Earth of the same intensity, and actually for the Sun it's true because it's very, very far, um, then we just multiply the intensity of the sunlight measured in some units by the area. The only thing is, if Sun is falling at the angle Sun rays, we really should not multiply by this area, we should multiply by this area from here. Right, because only these are really falling here. Uh, that's why there is an angle, like in this particular case. So exactly the same thing we will use here. Now the only thing is our problem is a little bit easier than in case of sun rays uh, falling at angle. Because here the angle is 90 degree always, because every intensity vector at any point is perpendicular. So if I want to calculate the whole thing, I should really calculate it in a very small area. Let's consider this a differential infinitesimally small area around some point P. So I calculate it in the P. Now it's perpendicular. So B, P, I multiply by DA by the area around it, differential of the area. So it's an infinitesimally small, like square around it. And that would be my infinitesimal piece of magnetic field flux by definition. So the definition of the magnetic field flux which is going through the area is for uniform field when all the at all the points my vector intensity vectors of intensity are the same you just multiply the intensity by the area if it's not uniform like in this particular case you're talking about differential a very infinitesimally small um, magnetic field flux, which is going through the infinitesimally small area GA. Now, why is it infinitesimal? Because inside the infinitesimal um, area, we assume that the field, magnetic field intensity, is uniform, obviously. Okay, so that's done. <coughs> and how to calculate intensity of the B? Uh, intensity of the uh, magnetic field at point B. P, sorry, P, at point P. Well, that's not easy either, because actually every piece of the wire has certain influence on this point, which means the B, P itself is supposed to be the result of the integration of this along the whole wire. 
So for every little piece ds here, we have to calculate the um, intensity, and then we should integrate it by the whole length of the wire. So that's how, in, in theory, it is done. Now, in case my wire is an ideal loop and I'm only calculating in the center, that was easier, that was a previous lecture. If you want to calculate at every point, that's much more difficult and it requires a lot of calculations, but it can be done. But in any case, so our problem right now to calculate the flux is basically two different integrations. Number one, integration along the wire to find at every particular point um, the intensity of the magnetic field. So we can just have function B of x, y where x and y are coordinate of this point. That's how we get it. And then we have to really integrate it around a circle or whatever the form of the loop is. So that's one thing and that's how we calculate this function. Now B, P means actually B of two coordinates where P is the point. And then another integration to get the flux is integration around the whole area. So we have one integral of dB, another integral would be uh, by dS, B of P times dS. Well, actually it's a double integral because we, uh, it's area. Now I am kind of loosely using the words integral. I assume that the calculus is familiar to you and concepts of infinitesimal, differential, etc. are familiar. If not, go back to Mass 14's course on the same website. I do recommend you to take the calculus uh, chapter at least and know everything, whatever is written there, because that's what definitely will be use, use, used in, in, in physics. So, these two integration or summarization in a more, I would say, simple language. We have to summarize the combined um, function, uh, combined intensity, if you wish, from each um, piece of the wire in any particular point, and then knowing the function of intensity of, uh, uh, of, of the position, we have to integrate by area to find the flux. And as a result, we get the total flux, which is going through this particular area. And again, it's kind of equivalent to amount of um, sun energy falling on the area. Or, for instance, you would like to know um, how much grass is growing in your backyard if you know the, uh, the rate of growth. So if you know the rate of growth of, this, of, of grass, which is kind of equivalent to intensity of the magnetic field, then, using this area and knowing the whole area of your backyard, you can calculate uh, how much uh, grass will go during, um, during the season. Now, in case of grass, we're talking really about uniform rate. Everyone, every, well, maybe it's not the case actually, but usually you have in the yard, you have the same kind of um, grass and it grows with the same um, rate, but maybe that's not the case. So if it's different kind of grass is uh, uh, in different areas of your backyard, then you have to calculate separately for each piece, right? And then summarize. That's exactly the same here. You have to calculate separ separately the intensity produced by each piece of this wire and then summarize because magnetic field as any other field is additive. So if there are like two different sources of the field, at any particular point you have to calculate the intensity of one, intensity of another, and they can be combined to get the total intensity. And we have already covered that in previous lectures. Okay. Now, this is kind of a complex in the general case, and it's not even general yet. I will talk about general case. In our practical problems, we will usually deal with uniform fields, magnetic fields, so the level of intensity is the same at every point and um, uh, and the shape would usually be relatively simple too 
and it would be probably flat. So, I mean, you can really imagine this wire not to be really like a flat on the XY um, plane, but something like a spiral or something like that. And God only knows what kind of magnetic field intensity is produced by this. Um, now, in many practical cases, we are talking about loop, but loop and loop and loop, many loops done uh, with the same wire in the same place, which can be relatively considered to be flat. Even it, it, there is some kind of a volume, obviously, but you can consider it to be flat, and that's why you can calculate the intensity of each one, of each loop, and then multiply by the number of loops. That's another thing which can be done, and we will probably address this as well in some problems. Okay, so now I can say that our problems will usually um, have uniform uh, magnetic fields, and uh, probably flat surfaces of, of the um, current which is going, which is actually creating the um, magnetic field. Now, what else? What's important is the units of measurements. You see the units of measurement, is com it comes from here. It's units of magnetic field intensity, which is Tesla, and units of area, which is meter square. So, one Tesla falling through one square meter is one Weber. So, Weber is a unit. One Weber is equal to one Tesla uh, going through one meter area. It's, by the way, it, from the practical standpoint, Weber is a very large unit. Tesla is a very large unit. So, um, usually um, flux is measured in like mini Teslas or nano Teslas, uh, Teslas, uh, Weber, sorry, mini Weber or, or nano Weber, whatever. Okay, what else? Now let's talk about generality. Again, it's just to familiarize yourself with a general concept rather than um, something which we will be using in, in real practical. Uh, and problems which I will talk about. So I, I would like to talk about the flux in a much more general um, case than just this particular loop. Now, and the general case is, first of all, a general field, magnetic field, and general surface. Now, what is a general magnetic field? Well, general magnetic field is a vector function of three coordinates or vector function of a point in a three-dimensional space. So, if you have a three-dimensional space where there is a magnetic field, source of which we are not really even discussing, whatever the source is, but as a result we have magnetic field. Now, how do we characterize magnetic field? Well, at any point in the space you have a vector which basically is the intensity of the magnetic field. This is the vector which actually is a source of the force whenever you have another magnet for instance near this so we, we know what magnetic field intensity is. General case is that's a vector function of the point in space. That's given. Now, general surface. Well, general surface in three-dimensional space is, well, general surface. I don't know how to even somehow. This is the general surface. It may be piece of a sphere, piece of the torus, piece of a, 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 a surface of a pair, whatever it is. doesn't really matter. So, how can we define the magnetic field flo uh, flux through this surface? Well, on the surface, surface is basically part of our space, so for every point on this surface we have a vector function, right? And we are I would like to draw it in all different directions because I don't know what kind of a source of magnetic field is. But anyway, for every point here I have certain value of um, magnetic field intensity. So what do I do next? 
Well, next I do basically the surface integration, that's how it's called. We did not consider it in my um, uh, calculus course, but you probably understand the concept of this. So I take infinitesimal piece, assuming, well, if, if, if it's inf infinitesimal around some point P, and, uh, uh, I can assume that within this area my magnetic uh, field intensity is uniform. So, this particular dA is differential of this area. <coughs> now, the magnetic field intensity is this. Now, in this particular case, in a general case, I don't know if this vector is perpendicular to the surface, right? In, in my previous example with the loop, I knew that my magnetic field intensity vectors are perpendicular to the surface of the loop and I'm only considering this loop. Now this surface is, God knows what it is, so direction can be uh, uh, any, so I have to multiply by cosine of some angle, where angle is basically the angle between the vector of intensity B and normal, perpendicular to the surface, to this little piece of my surface. So then I have to integrate, it's a double integration for the whole surface, for the whole area A. So I have to summarize. So at every point I have a small um, differential of the area uh, of the surface around it and considering my value of the intensity at the point is uniform throughout this infinitesimally small area I just multiply it by the area and the cosine uh, of the angle between um, the intensity vector and normal to this particular surface, little piece of surface, the perpendicular to this piece of surface. And well, if this um, angle is zero, which means if my intensity vector B is is normal, then cosine of zero will be one, so it's not really uh, partic partic participate in this. If my B is tangential to the surface, so the angle between tangential and the normal is 90 degree, I will have zero here. So if my field goes tangentially to this little piece of surface, it does not generate any uh, flux. Same thing as with the sun ray. If sun rays go this way, and you, and this is the area, this is the flat area, it does not really uh, uh, warm up this area. It doesn't really fall on this. It just goes um, passing it by, basically. That's what happens actually around the uh, North Pole or South Pole, and that's why it's very cold over there because the sun rays are at angle to the surface. And uh, this is a general concept. Again, I just wanted you to, to have a feel. I'm not really defining anything more precisely than this, but it's a surface integral, so you have to summarize all these little pieces. And there is obviously a certain amount of you know mathematics which basically tells you how to do it, depending obviously on the surface. You can't do it on any surface. You have to do it on some regular surface, like for instance, if it's a piece of the sphere and regular um, uh, magnetic field intensity uh, which you might actually get. So for any simple, well mathematically simple cases which can be functionally described, everything is basically calculable. Uh, but we are not really getting into this because it's kind of too complex mathematics and not really needed. So we will usually consider uniform intensity fields and usually flat surfaces whenever we will talk about um, the magnetic flux. But in any case you have to really know that the flux is a very very useful thing. Um, we will use it um, in uh, not even in, in, in theory but also in some practical um, usage of the electricity, for instance transformers. It's all based on the flux. Well, that's it for today. Thank you very much. I do recommend you to read 
the notes for this lecture on physics 14. Um, it's, uh, you have to go to the course from the unisor.com, you have to choose physics 14, then um, electromagnetism, and among, among the electromagnetism, you have properties of magnetic properties of direct current, and one of those is the definition of magnetic flux. So thank you very much and good luck.